Now, my name is Pascal. I work for the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. And that's an organization that sort of an umbrella for this event. And one of the members is GIZ. Tanya is from GIZ. It's a member-driven organization of 38 global um, agriculture rural development organizations, World Bank, GIZ. I'm not going to tell you all the 38. Okay. Now, before we start with the presentations, um, I want to actually introduce The panel to the audience. Here's the, or the other way around. This is the audience panel. This is my sample here. That's <laughs> Leda, and she's actually here because she wants to know a little bit more about the pressure uh, for smallholders, where she comes from. I want solutions. You so want you give me solution how to solve this pressure, this contradiction between food production, development, and conservation. Okay, so you need to change your whole presentation now because you know what the audience <laughs> oh, no. wants to hear. Okay, now this was just a little example to make sure that we reflect what you're interested in. And now when the new people come, please come to the front. Don't do the same thing again. Just please come up to the front. Don't just all sit there in the middle, please. Okay. Now... We start with Deborah, Deborah Bosio. She's working for SIAD, which is the Center for Tropical Agriculture Research. And she will start with framing our subject in the SDG debate. Do you want to take it from there? I'm not going to say much more. She can introduce herself. And as well. Okay. Oh, it's on. Okay. Great. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming to this session. I was asked to give just a very um, brief framing of uh, this session within the whole concept of the, of the sustainable uh, development goals. And I'm very excited about the, the progress that we've made in a very short time on these sustainable development goals and the post-2015 agenda and about Please. the linking of this forum, the Global Landscape Vote. Forum, with the, the sustainable um, development agenda post 2015. I think it's a big step forward in terms of understanding the role of landscape approaches in our, our possible futures. I want to start back just only a few years ago at the Rio Plus 20, which was in 2012. That's when um, the member states agreed to launch the process to set a set of sustainable development goals. So that's only three years ago that we actually started on a process to try to define what um, these goals would look like. At that time, a document was, was produced called The Future We Want. And The Future We Want did a lot of framing of basically the aspirations for our, um, the sustainable sort of development agenda. And um, for example, in The Future We Want, they brought, forward to, um, they brought forward the concept of a land degradation neutral world, which has now been incorporated into the draft goals and targets uh, of the agenda. Um, since the Rio Plus 20, we've had the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals has been working to define these limited set of, of goals and targets. This has been a very innovative process, much different from the Millennium Development Goals, for example. This had a constituency-based system of extensive involvement with re relevant stakeholders to actually come up and define the set of goals that we have now, which on the should be noted is really still just a draft of these goals. There's 17 goals in draft form to be ratified next year, or next year. So even though now we have these 17 goals that cover everything from eradicating poverty, they have the universality um, clause and, and include actually sustainability within the development agenda. So for the first time, this concept that development and sustainability can actually go hand in hand rather than be an either or kind of a proposition. That's what's important, I think, about these goals. But there's a lot of things that still remain in question as to what's going to happen. Um, one of them is how sustaining natural resources can actually be sort of fully integrated into the relevant aspects of these goals. We still have a goal 15 that has terrestrial ecosystems. So we've sort of lumped a lot of the natural resources work into a separate goal from development. But on the other hand, some of the goals are already starting to integrate the concept. So 
the, the proposed goal number two refers specifically to sustainable agriculture as a vehicle to end hunger and improve nutrition. So it's, so it's, it's integrated into one of the highest level important goals of, of hunger and nutrition. Um, goal 15 does refer to sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems and halting land degradation. What's important for this session is how do landscape approaches actually help us to achieve these sustainable development goals in whatever final form they actually take. What does a landscape approach actually bring to that table? What is the added value of this landscape approach that most of us are sort of bought into or we wouldn't even be here at, at the forum? Um, one thing, one point I'd like to make is that these, um, these sustainable development goals won't be possible to be reached if we continue on this very sectoral type of approach. Forestry is the main entry point to all climate change mitigation, for example. We need to be considering agriculture, forestry, and other human endeavors in sort of these multi-sectoral approaches to, to sustainable development, i.e. that is basically the definition of a landscape approach. So, so one of the main messages here, I think we'll all agree, but we could see what are the, whole, the bottlenecks there, is that these integrated landscape approach really are essential to achieving the, the sustainable development goals. One thing we heard this morning at the, um, at the, the, <coughs> the opening plenary already is it's not anymore about um, uh, you know, being convinced that, that landscapes are important, etc. It's, it's sort of about the how. And when you get to the how, that is really what we're here to talk about today, I think, some examples of what we really mean. A mistake we might be making is this idea of we packaging landscapes as a single thing. The landscape approach is our new golden, you know, our new silver bullet of some kind. But that's not the case. It's a diversity of landscapes that encompass croplands, pastures, forests, under varying degrees of pressure. And we need to maintain a focus on that diversity. There's not one solution. Um, and another thing that's very important about the landscape approach is that you include not only, say, productive uses of the landscape, but also urban water supplies, natural resources extraction, uh, or cultural values also as important um, uh, goods and benefits that we get from the landscapes. So sustainable land use and sustainable landscape use varies just as much as the, the landscapes themselves do. Each initiative requires unique combination of policy, financial science components to actually deliver success on sustainable landscape management. And here we mean success in terms of restored ecosystem services, um, but also sustained crop production and tangible benefits for uh, local peoples, marginal groups, and women. So, um, for example, in our work uh, at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, we work on the, in one landscape that I think is, an, uh, is a useful example of, of how a landscape approach can actually bring, bridge the sectors and bring the right investment and uh, all, that, all the critical elements together in a particular place. Um, we're working with, um, with the Nature Conservancy, with Kenya Power Company, with Kenya Water Supply and the breweries to try to bring together um, investment in clean water to support upstream sustainable land management. So here you have to look at the entire landscape from the downstream urban users of water to the upstream smallholder farmers and learn how to make sure that the benefits flow all the way around in the circle for sustainable land management. And that's a good example of, um, of how a landscape approach can be cross the sectors and bring together the different kinds of investments. So in, <laughs> sorry. in this okay. session titled um, uh, Landscapes Under Pressure, what we're doing here really is uh, exploring a variety of entry points uh, to preserve livelihoods and natural resources. These entry points can be both social and technical, and each requires some sort of fundamental changes in either institutions, governance, private sector behavior, and citizenship. Uh, our case examples are really varied uh, with our three presentations. Preserving and managing biocultural uh, diversity as one entry point to um, achieving SDGs in landscapes. Reducing food losses, and as an entry point to increase resource use efficiency and reduce climate impacts. And then as well, uh, an example of transboundary agreements based on cultural identities as one of the an interesting and innovative uh, uh, approaches to landscapes. So with these presentations, we hope to discuss and really broaden our understanding of the variety of the entry points there are and um, see how 
landscape approaches bring an integrated view that can help us to achieve the sustainable development goals. Thank Thanks. you very much. Now, I think we can say that Deborah has said that she's a strong believer in the landscapes approach. I want to just ask uh, the audience who thinks that the landscape approach is an added value. If you can just raise your hand. just want to know. No, no, no second questions. It's either or. Who believes it's an added value? I think there was quite a lot of hands up there. Okay. Maybe you can tell us just for one second why you think that is. Yeah, no, I think some of the, the added value in, in the landscapes approach is, is moving away from the sectoral approach. And, and I hope, hope we're going to hear a little bit about agriculture and this whole push on climate smart agriculture, which seems to be technologically driven and not really making the connection yet to, to other ecosystems within the landscapes. And, and I'm hoping that, that as, as the landscape approach begins to inform other types of approaches, we can see that bringing agriculture more into the landscape and getting the agronomists out of the field just as the foresters need to get out of the forest and talk to other people the agronomists need to get out of their field and talk to, to, to the other folks in the landscapes so i think there's added value in in pushing people to go beyond their own sectoral vision and even if they see their their sector as the entry point they understand what they're entering into okay thank you very much i want to leave it with that um i want to go over to cora and uh i think what I learned from her so far is that she's also a strong believer. She thinks that social change and institutions need to be changed to give the landscapes approach a proper chance. I, I, I think so, and even much more will have to change. I would like to pick up on what Louise says, is that um, the added value of landscape approaches for me is the spatial aspect. It is the connecting the different sectors and actors and scales to a particular place on earth. And I think that is sometimes overlooked and we talk about integration and so on and so forth, but space and place as such is, I think, the, the biggest added value. I, I would like to move to my slides. Can I do so, please? I've got a few slides just to illustrate my story and also to avoid you looking at me. I'd rather have you looking at the screen if there is something on the screen. Technicians, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there it is. Uh, okay, building on what Deborah said, the, the sustainable goals, the development goals, how can landscape approaches actually give an added value to that? Well, we believe that it's really the spatial element that is the added value. A landscape approach used to be started, or was actually started, from the, from the site of the forests. Uh, Peter Holmgren, Holmgren was speaking here before as the director of C4. I think C4 was one of the biggest promoters of the landscape approach because they realized that if you work in forests, you have to realize that forests these days are fragmented every day more. And forests as such cannot be looked at independently from the people who live in the forest and who live from the forest, who build their households and their livelihoods there. And here we have a rural village, but increasingly rural inhabitants, they move to the cities and, um, and, and they, they produce commercially and they, they produce large scale commodities, which are necessary to feed the cities. So somehow the connectedness between the rural and the urban is an important aspect of this landscape approach. And then the cities, of course, they highly depend on the industry. And without industries, we don't have solid landscapes. And then the industries, they rely on the water, which is coming from the landscape and which is feeding the landscape with all its social and economic activities and which give also a biocultural identity to this particular landscapes. And then we increasingly have the mining industry and miners, whether they like it or not, whether they realize it or not, they do have a huge influence on the landscape. They are co-shapers of the landscape, together with the inhabitants and other shapers in the landscape. Here we have a typical spatial image of a landscape, but we increasingly realize that it's not just the local stakeholders who shape the landscape, but increasingly so, our landscapes are entangled in global processes. 
We have mobility. In this case, I think it's KLM, not sure though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which provides the connection, not only the interconnectedness in a landscape, but its connectedness to global processes, like the coffee consumers who, whether they like it or not, are directly connected to the area where the coffee is being produced. They are co-shapers of the landscape. They are involved, whether they know it or not. We have all sort of international agreements and trade relations that shape the landscape. So somehow, if we look at the landscape, we have to take into account these international treaties that have such a high influence. And, and that's sometimes overseen, but increasingly recognized. That is the business world and the investors that are also involved, because they, to a high extent, shape the landscape and define how a landscape looks like. Now, for us, a landscape approach is not just the recognition of this multi-actor and multi-sector and multi-scale dynamics. It's not enough for us, and I'm talking on behalf of my colleagues in Wageningen, um, for us there is more, that for us a crucial element is how do we bring all these actors and sectors together. <laughs> How do we somehow interconnect them? And while recognizing that they all have different stories, different worldviews, different discourses, they are interconnected and what connects them is this landscape, the place they are shaping. So how can we bring them somehow together around a table, including the youth, the new generation, including the biodiversity? And how can we make them collectively plan? Well, in order to do so, we believe we need a lot of changes. And not just the small marginal changes, but really big changes. A first big change that we believe is necessary to make this landscape approach happen is institutional change. <laughs> and here I come back to what uh, Deborah was already talking about. Our landscapes are very often managed and steered by silos. We've got the agricultural stronghold, and we've got the water experts and, 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 and the, the, the city planners, and, and they really like to work isolatedly from each other. They forget to realize that as co-shapers, they have to work together. So this whole fragmentation, the way in which we fragment our whole governance, our whole institutional frames, will bring us to a change in governance which is needed. And yesterday with the youth, we talked a lot about it. The youth actually helped me with this presentation. I, I really recognize them. I, I, I'm thankful to them. But governance, we have organized our society in a very vertical way. And yesterday I tried to illustrate this uh, vertical way in which we have organized our society. I think you know this. should know it. Well, uh, anyway, <laughs> we have organized our world in all nested scales. And that's not a bad thing, but it has somehow led to a whole sectoral silo way of managing our space. And the question is then there, where do landscapes fit in? Are we to create a new layer, which is called landscape? Or are we having, do we have to be more clever and change from this sectoral way of organizing our society into a much more network way of organizing our society? A network across sectors and skills, but whoops, it's gone. Can somebody help me to get it back? <laughs> the way actually, it, it, this network way of organizing society networks rooted in place would look more like this. So the big question is, how can we reorganize our society from such a model and bring it into such a model where we can twist and turn and connect skills? And I hoped it would have been yeah. the hair that it is. <laughs> okay. So this is, the diff this is the change which is needed. Now in order to get to that change, well that's a big point, we have to illustrations after this presentation that will help us understand how we can bring about such a change. But more change is needed. 
we need to change something with our businesses. Because, funny enough, our businesses, however they try to do their best, they are also organized in such a vertical way. They are totally based on their product chains. And they realize that their product chains are currently at risk. And they certainly do a lot to improve their chains. But it is a vertical improvement. Ah, they, they talk about responsible business, which is excellent. And they use landscapes for branding and, and marketing. And they really do their best to not do harm. But we want more than that. We actually would love to do business, uh, do good instead of no harm. And that requires a different way in which businesses operate. And, and we believe something has to move from the thinking in chains to the thinking in circles. And from the change in, in from, aha, that is where it goes. For the thinking of landscapes, not just as sourcing areas, but as investment areas. Not only taking products out, but bringing products back in and creating a flow of creating what I would call a restorative industry. So moving from an extractive to a restorative industry. I, I think that's really needed, the, the difference between do no harm and the do good. And um, I've got this beautiful image of the Lus Plateau in China, I think you've seen it. And this is actually, a lot of money is being made by this extractive to restorative industry. And then I'm, I'm almost through, don't worry. <laughs> we also need to get there a change in investment and, and a, a, a change in the thinking of investors and, and to enable them to create investment models which are, which, which are geographically defined and learn to see landscapes as, as investment areas where you can work with bundles of products or bundles of goods and services where you can derive your return from. And then we have to help them to not only think in financial returns, but realize that actually a return can also be social, can be natural, even inspiration can be seen as a return on investment. So how to move to that circular economy thing. And then a last change which we, will, which we think we need for that is actually a change in citizenship. How to help citizens to fit in this new model. And, and, and then we thought, actually, what you would need for that is, is a citizenship, a, a state in which citizens, instead of being degraders, become protagonists and, and protectors and, and create a bond or reconnect to the place they own or reconnect to the biocultural identity of the place they are attached to. And that's a big step. But funny enough, for a lot of people, local people, indigenous people, it's not such a big step. It's actually quite common sense. So how, how to get back this biocultural di diversity, this identity of place, and bring that back into the system? How to create this environmental citizenship in which people are actually willing to pay the price for all these changes through their consumptive behavior and through the way in which they work and use their environment. I thought probably the best illustration is this picture. How to create such a sort of citizenship where people out of their sense of place respect and, 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 and restore. Um, that's the end of my story. It's the, that's the end of the story. That's okay. the beginning of change. Okay. <laughs> When you started uh, talking about do no harm, I was thinking about Google, and I was wondering how you're going to bring Google into this landscape picture. That, that would be cool because <laughs> Google actually knows how this model works, and okay. probably we should, they should, we should help them, or they should help us to create this. Now I don't know about you, but I think for me, I've learned that um, the landscape approach. You could debate whether you need that or not, but um, for me, I think it's just a, any type of approach that brings in more complexity into, into the way you handle it. I think that's probably what, what is needed. You can call it whatever you want. Um, the second thing that I think I've learned from this is that um, we need a lot of changes, and 
it's not all about knowledge, what everybody's talking about, knowledge transfer and knowledge, uh, bringing knowledge to the people. But if you want to actually bring about change, you have to motivate people, I guess. And the question would be how to do all this business change and, and all that. Now, from that, I want to go over and hand over to Tanya, who's with uh, an advisor with a GIZ. And she's going to talk about the rice value chain in Nigeria and um, what she believes what could be done. I think she's going to tell us that industrialized production can actually be better for the environment than just traditional. Let's see how she does it. <laughs> okay, thank you Pascal. Yes, in fact I want to talk about sustaining landscapes and show you that food losses matter and I will also t compare a traditional with an industrialized value chain for that. Uh, just to give you a bit of the background, huh? the topic of food losses is much debated. There's a lot of figures on it uh, all over the world. We here made the attempt to look at only two sources and just to show you the range of, of, of figures. Huh? It's, uh, for instance, if you look at sorghum in Africa, the sources talk about 0 to 40 percent of losses. If you look at the fruits and vegetables, it's if you include distribution or not, there's a high range, 30 to, to 51 percent. Uh, this is to illustrate that there's a lot of research still needed in order to look at food losses. Uh, the newest studies that are published, those sources are a bit older, uh, give some evidence that tells us that some of those figures have been exaggerated, that the losses in fact are a little bit smaller. However, they are still very relevant and they are one very important issue in agriculture, how you can mitigate climate change. So actually I heard from, from Swiss uh, researchers that it's actually the most important mit mitigation possibility for agriculture, more than other techniques. Now, looking at food losses and landscapes, I think Cora already gave us uh, a very good background. The challenge is that there's a conceptual difference between this value chain approach and the circle approach that landscapes uh, tell us, uh, where you have a spatial dimension and where you, it's more locally based. However, the interconnections are there. Um, I will, decisions on farm level or at processing level, however, also influence the surrounding lands, landscapes a lot. And that is something that we have to take into consideration when talking about value chains, efficiency, and so on. Um, there's a growing common concern about the limited nature resources for food and non-food production, a, a growing concern about overuse of nature resources, about land use changes, and climate change. And of course, also the topic of food security is important in relation to food losses. Now, we did several case studies. I here want to present the results of the latest study which looks at the rice value chain in Nigeria. Uh, rice is a major staple food in Nigeria. Uh, the local demand increases a lot. And there's a supply-demand gap, which is bridged by imports, which of course have a much higher environmental footprint, not only due or not mainly due to the transport, but to the higher methane emissions that occur uh, in Asian rice production compared to the African rice production. Uh, the scope of the GIZ funded study uh, was on the one hand to determine, to quantify losses and on the other hand uh, to calculate the environmental footprint of those losses. For that more than 200 rice farmers have been interviewed, 30 millers, 30 marketers from two states in Nigeria. And uh, it looked at, uh, uh, it analyzed uh, the whole chain from cultivation, harvest, storing, processing, and distribution of the rice. Focus was the lowland rice production. Um, it determined quantitative and qualitative food losses and the environmental footprint, which is probably for the landscape uh, topic the most important one. And at the end, I will present some recommendations on how to improve. Uh, uh, those value chains, how to reduce losses and also how to bring down the environmental footprint. Um, looking at the rice value chain in Nigeria, at least 90% of the rice farmers are subsistence oriented smallholders which sell only the surplus production. Uh, the average farm size is around 2.5 hectare. 
And the cultivation is mainly done manually with uh, sickle harvesting, with direct seeding, with manual threshing. And from, from this point, uh, from the small holders, the surplus production goes either into a traditional processing uh, where the producers do the processing themselves, they do, they do parboiling uh, in their, on their farms directly, uh, open fire, they dry on mats, they mill it with smalls in, in small scale mills which are diesel driven and the outcome is a very low quality product and the co-products, brands and husks of the rice which have some value either as fodder for animals or as burning material are very seldom used only. On the other hand, the industrial processing, uh, um, we only looked at one example here in Nigeria at one processing plant that purchases the paddy, paddy from the farmers. Here you see an integrated processing uh, where parboiling, drying, milling, polishing and color sorting is done within that plant. There are almost no losses in, in those steps of the, of the processing, of the, of the value adding. The rice husks are used as burning material, the brands are used as fodder, and the outcome is a high quality product which can be sold at higher prices, of course. Mm -hmm. Now looking, I show you some pictures. Here you see the manual rice production, you see the harvest, uh, you see the, the soil uh, works, mm -hmm. you see the parboiling, which is done on open fire on traditional ovens. Rice is dried on mats, as I said. And then here you see a rice mill, and then you see what is remaining of the rice. It's usually only thrown into the landscape. It's, it's not used, it's, it's there. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's like waste dumping site, which doesn't look nice and is of no use, actually. This is the integrated, uh, the industrialized value chain, the, the processing plant um, in comparison to that. Okay. Those are the results of the analysis of the losses. I don't want to go into very much detail here. It's just to tell you that we found in that Nigeria example that roughly 25% of the, of the rice is lost. Um, we found that the hotspots in the value chain are uh, on the one hand uh, during harvest, threshing and winnowing of the paddy. You see that here you have between 4 and 5% of losses. And during the parboiling process on the farms. Huh? I'm, I'm talking about the traditional value chain here. So those are the, the, the main issues, but at every step of the, of the value chain, you see that losses occur and they sum up to almost 25%. Somehow this remote doesn't want to work. Now, those losses, uh, we, we use them to calculate an environmental footprint. So this graph looks at the contribution of different life cycle phases to the global warming potential of one ton of rice. So the CO2 equivalent is shown here. You see that uh, in terms of methane, field emissions, fertilizer and so on, there's not a big difference. The big difference between the traditional and the industri industrial chain is the parboiling, where you see the red flesh on top there. Um, and that is the main reason why the industrial value chain has a much better environmental footprint in terms of CO2 emissions, but also in terms of, uh, of other uh, topics important for the environmental footprint. If we look at the value of rice, doesn't like me that remote. If we look at the value of rice, it becomes even more obvious. You see here uh, the, the kg CO2 equivalent for 100 naira of rice. And uh, for 100 naira of rice, you can buy a larger quantity of traditional rice, a lower quantity of industrial rice, which is, has higher quality and is therefore sold to higher prices. And here you see that it's, uh, that it's almost half. So the industrial value chain is, is 
twice as good, let's say, than compared to the traditional one. So what does that mean in terms of conclusions? Uh, reducing post-harvest losses in the Nigerian rice value chain is relevant for both food security and climate change mitigation. And that is not only relevant for the Nigerian rice value chain, but also for all other value chains where losses occur. Uh, the methane emissions occur on an area basis. That means if you increase production, uh, if you increase the yields, that will also lower uh, the methane emissions per quantity. Uh, parboiling contributes significantly to negative impact on the surrounding landscapes, on the one hand due to the emissions, but then also if you think about landscape linkages, of course, uh, it contributes also to deforestation. Uh, the integrated mill has improved environmental performance due to the integrated parboiling process, which is fueled by the residues that are there, the reduction in losses, valuable byproducts, and improved quality of the final product. Now, there are some options for improving the sustainability of the rice value chain in Nigeria. Uh, I'm sure we can add more here in the discussion, but those are only a few points. Huh? On the one hand, it's important to support farmers to organize themselves uh, in order to, to be able also to be part of an industrialized value chain. It is important to reduce the losses by improving farmers' access to improve threshing and harvesting technology, where you saw the high percentage of losses. Knowledge is important, seeds and other inputs are important as well. Now, a very important point that can be discussed also later on, it, it, it would be important to support industrial processing. And what is the role of the private sector here? We need more investors to have more industrial processing. We also found evidence in the potato value chain in Kenya that contract farmers that are part of an uh, industrialized value chain have less losses. That doesn't say anything about the farmers' incomes, but the losses are reduced, and that is important uh, for environmental protection. Traditional processing can also be improved. You can introduce improved rice milling machines uh, with capability to separate bran from husk and separate broken grains. And, uh, of course, you can use modern parboiler, parboilers, de-stoners. You have improved ovens that are already developed that use also the residues as burning material. So those improved stoves can halve the emissions with the global warming potential in the parboiling step. And with those words, I would like to thank you. The studies are available. The RISE study is not yet online, but will be soon. And don't hesitate to contact me if you would like to have it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think you can see I didn't promise the wrong thing. She's a strong believer in that the industrializing helps there to save the environment. So I would like to ask you, who believes that that's the case? You want to raise your hand. Please raise your hand if you believe that industrializing these processes actually helps the saving the environment. Yes, yes, there are some. They're very hesitant. They only go halfway up. <laughs> okay. Okay, with that, we're moving to Rajan Kochu. He's with Isimot, and he works in the Hindu Kush area, eight countries actually in the Himalayan. And he believes that it's very important to work transboundary to save the environment. Go tell us yes, about it. I think it's working. Thank work. you very much. Well, uh, distinguished ladies hand. and gentlemen, very... I have now the opportunity to take over. Well, as we say, you know, planning without action is often fatal, and action without planning is futile. At the end of the day, you have to demonstrate on the ground that in a transboundary scale, you can actually move things as we are trying to do in geopolitically hotspot in the Himalayas, where countries like India, China, Nepal are just neighboring each other. And uh, just to take you for a while how the action is being done as the previous two presentations we are talking about in an area which is the birthplace of 10 rivers in a way and 10 major rivers, Ganges and even the Yellow River of China. But also it is about five key religions in the world, Hinduism and Buddhism who belong to this landscape, who treat this landscape as 
one of the cultural cradle uh, of the region, but also we talk about over 1,000 languages, which are in these areas, still living languages, so that will tell you something about the culture. But not to forget the four bio hotspots in this, 32 of the bio hotspots in the world are in this area. So let me take you a little bit uh, in the action. I hope it works, yes, it does work. Uh, well, this is an area, you know, it's very often to talk about uh, frameworks and then uh, talk about the concepts. At the end of the day, when you go to the ground, you have the difficulty, and the difficulty is the data is not available, or the data is not comparable, or you don't know much about how ecosystems work in the Himalayas, and what is the interface between these ecosystems which are producing these value chains, which are linked to that uh, intensive culture I was talking about of five religions and different tribal groups which are in the area. All this is a kind of an open question that the rationale has to be built. Why we are coming uh, countries together and working on a transboundary landscape? What really moves the subject of water? Which is, as I said, 10 rivers, a lot of glaciers, and they bring you a lot of water. So that's something to talk about where we are. But things are not all that bad. You can see that India, China, Nepal are already have something in their national strategies, development strategies, national uh, biodiversity action plans. They are talking about let's come together in terms of multilateral cooperation, bilateral cooperation, and that's where we are trying to build in to talk about these 1.3 billion people in the Himalayas which are relying on the ecosystem services which come from the Himalayas. Um, now, this is just to give you a frame. Uh, we are talking about a green one, Kerala sacred landscape, operational landscape, where we are working between India, China, and Nepal. Uh, and the rest of the landscape, the yellow color, they take you really the heterogeneous uh, sections of the Himalayas, left-hand side, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, very arid and very tough area. On the right-hand side, Myanmar, Bangladesh, almost like a tropical climate. All this uh, heterogeneity of ecosystems, cultures, ecoregions which are there, corridor connectivity which is there, that is what really moves us to work in this landscape. But not to forget, at the end of the day, whatever we produce, if it is not really coming from science, that's what IPCC report says, where is the science to prove that glaciers are melting and that therefore we have to uh, take actions from the science. But also we have to produce something which policymakers and practitioners are actually biting at the end of the day. There's, yes, there is a critical evidence. We really need to generate that knowledge and then share that knowledge and go forward. Um, this will give you just a small glimpse where we are. Uh, as I said, bio hotspot as well as geopolitical hotspot. These are three countries, China, India, and Nepal, and there's a holy peak of the name of Kalash and two big wetlands, uh, Mansarovar as one of them, and Rakshas. Uh, on the right hand side, you might get a glimpse of why we are there. We are there because there are gaps of science and there are also cultural linkages. That's why these countries have come together. The two uh, entry points, it was mentioned by the first um, presentation as well as second, and that is really lead to livelihoods. The livelihoods are the key, and the second entry point we do believe is livelihoods are dependent on the ecosystems, and the ecosystems are also dependent on people because people manage them. So you come to an uh, entry point which is yellowish one and two, that gives you a feeling that where the program is focusing, because at the end of the day, if people don't see the benefit in transboundary landscape concept, it's not working. And all other can fall in place later. But keeping, given the fact we are talking about feminization of mountain culture, that means the men are moving out due to whatever problems, climatic, non-climatic, uh, but we therefore do look into gender, we do look into transboundary natural resource ma governance, we do talk about private sector as a cross-cutting joining platform for the three countries as well as the valuation science. We have to put more value uh, on the ecosystems which are there and create that science based on that. That's how it works. It is working on the left hand side India, on the right hand side Nepal and in the center you will see where we are working together. Action on the ground as I said is very very important. Uh, <clears throat> 
Now, what has really so far worked in terms of building milestones? We have done a lot. We have value chains which are transboundary, in this case, Indian butter tree and honey. We have Reuters Market Light, which uh, gives communication information to tribals which don't have any roads coming to their village, but they have a mobile phone. They get all the information, weather, climate, uh, fertilizer prices, market prices, and that's what we are trying to build uh, in, in this landscape, but also linking value chains to sustain ecosystem management. And, <clears throat> but that's not the case. Often when you go to the people, then you find other problems. It's not the problem of value chain. Problem was our spring heads are drying up, drying up due to climate change. So therefore, you have to give another, you know, attention that is spring head conservation and all the agendas, you know, global level. We want to also move certain things like CBD agenda, biodiversity, uh, uh, cultural protocols, we have, which we are trying to raise and see that people are also benefiting from them. But now, how does it work at the end of the day? On the upper side, you see three countries come together in terms of a program steering committee or a program management unit. On the lower half, you find where actually action is done and how this feedback loop is getting into the national level and how we come to the international level at the end of the day to move the things. Um, this is just a you know, snapshot. How do we really move having an edifice of transboundary landscapes, taking it upwards, having some set of deliverables, uh, partners, credible partners, uh, then moving things on local level, national level, global level, uh, and, and the right-hand side, definitely seeing that regional cooperation is manifested in the longer run, and scientific information is shared and, and created, and then finally also good governance at the landscape level, but benefit for the people. These are then the last two uh, slides. Um, what has really worked? Really what has worked is the ownership, because countries do believe that it is a kind of a soft diplomacy. We are talking here about people's benefit, cultural benefit, so let's own this initiative as such. The second is communication really matters, because all our value chains where people are producing the products I was talking about, they are getting this information and they are getting other information, vice versa, the information from the ground level is also coming to the national level to move things there. But at the end of the day, as I said, Kailash landscape is a holy landscape. The culture is very, very important. So we are building on responsible tourism, which takes us to the heritage of this, uh, <clears throat> heritage preservation of this particular uh, landscape. Then finally, I think we do talk about transboundary markets, which are not possible without having institutions on the ground, which deliver that governance, which uh, uh, Ustin was talking about, which really deliver that governance, good governance across the borders. Now, this is what I have to say at the end. There's a lot of scope because I was talking about geopolitical sensitiveness. At the end of the day, we have to demonstrate that model and we are practicing that model at the end uh, of the day. And institutions and governance, we are, as I said, I gave you an example of India and Nepal, how they are coming together and creating this market, creating that management plan being shared and creating that chance of good natural resource management governance across the borders. Last but not least, converging the innovations. The landscape is something, as the first picture was shown um, earlier, that it really brings certain stakeholders together. Not certain, but whole, a lot of multiple stakeholders uh, brought together. But at the end of the day, when you are converging innovations, RAD plus, value chain, private sector, ecosystem management, at a transboundary landscape, there's an absolute chance that you are doing the right thing as we have done so far. So that's at the end of the day. Let the peak bless you uh, forever and times to come. Okay, thank you very much. I think, I don't know if, you, if I misstate that, but I think you can say that you are a strong believer in uh, transboundary mechanisms, regional organizations that work. I mean, surely it's, it's not so easy to say that because you would have to figure out how they actually work. So that's maybe taking us to the next round then how you can actually do all these things. But uh, since I've asked you questions before, and they were all difficult because there's always a big how to, to the question, but 
do you think that we need more coordinating mechanisms? Who believes that we need more coordinating mechanisms? Okay. Right, that's quite a lot. Even though we all know that there are a lot of coordinating mechanisms that don't have uh, really a lot of power, that are ins institutions with any teeth that are not hooked to government or to business. Let's take it from there. I would like to invite uh, my colleagues here also to phrase a, a question. <coughs> Otherwise, I would ask anyone to come up who wants to ask a question. Maybe connected to Rajan, to the coordinating mechanism. Anyone? Thank you, Rajan. I uh, don't envy your position. This must be the equivalent of working in the eye of the cyclone, and <laughs> it's one of the most difficult places on earth. Um, uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a farmer from Ethiopia. I also represent the Farmers Cooperative. Uh, for all of you, um, I, I started today extremely skeptical, and I'm ending the day a lot less skeptical. And I think you said it's the new silver bullet. I don't know if it's the soup of the day or whatever euphemism we want to say. As a farmer, I have some concerns, and I'm not sure I can frame it in a way of a question. But I, it gets to the point of four years ago, we started on a journey to improve farmer productivity and our outputs and our yields and to become more sustainable or, quote, responsible in the use of fertilizers and appropriate seed. Now, the experience, I don't know if you were in the plenary, there was a short, brief film showed about what we went through in Ethiopia in one area in this landscape approach, which worked very well. It takes a tremendous amount of resource tremendous amount of coordination, a tremendous amount of communal arm twisting, and learning to navigate your very nice people organizations to figure out, should I speak to Ilri, Vaganigan, USAID, DFID, who comes to the table and how do I get this? Because you're all in silos. Nobody's doing what Google is doing the transformative, transformative and uh, revolutionary stuff of disrupting the existing status quo. Just working my way through the United Nations and who to talk to about some very simple technologies that FAO has been writing about. What are we doing about making it easy for the community of farmers in the world who have been taking care of the land to now figure out how to make this work. It's not easy to get the money out of the EU to do these large-scale projects do or anybody else. Do you have any, you have any suggestion how to do it? I, I really am at a loss. With arm twisting, any suggestion? Uh, you, you need to have a government that, is, that knows how to do it. But from a farmer's point of view, I'm, I'm listening to this and wondering, there's no place in here to understand how a farmer's cooperative or group of farmers can participate or organize or be involved in this. This seems to me a lot of you know, top-heavy intellectual stuff that has to be planned and organized and funded. And then what will it do to me in terms of my output as a farmer? Okay. Any one of you there? Wants to respond? You have your mic. Yeah, uh, my mic is working. Thanks very much. Very interesting. At the end, you are talking about how do you how do you really upscale such a such a model, as such. What I do firmly believe, and the belief comes that we are doing it in a way. Uh, currently, just an example: a group of Indian farmers is in Nepal, which I have taken. They are looking into this value chain issues in Nepal, and then Nepalese will go to the India. This is one way community to community, farmer to farmer interface. But that's only half the trouble. The important thing is where are finally the resources coming from? 
We know that we have very limited resources. Right from the beginning, it's very, very important to take on board all the public schemes which are in that area. And if you don't involve uh, as an institution, if I'm going as EC mode or as uh, any other organization, talking to farmers, working with different NGOs, at the end of the day, if government doesn't show the ownership, very, very difficult. Therefore, right from the day one, whatever we are doing, it is discussed with the local government and the local line agencies. We prepare a plan and the agencies finally see where are their uh, bits of puzzles where they can contribute to. I think that's very, very important. I call it often convergence of resources and also expertise, but also preparing a model which can be also replicated. And this government ownership that way, because we are not working parallel to the government, often that happens in the projects. We should never do that. So we should put them on the board right from the day one, and it works. And Tony, I wanted to respond as well. Okay, then I use this one. Um, I have two replies to you. I don't know whether they help, but it's, it's reflections that I personally have. On the one hand, I think the donors also have to coordinate themselves and to sit together and to find mechanisms of funding and of getting resources very practically to the people, be it small scale funds or whatever. I think that is a work that, that donor organizations have to do to ease access of farmer organizations or local other local organizations to, to, to get support. On the other hand, I think a landscape approach is an ideal model that you will never implement fully in reality. I think you can, you can build landscape approaches around a common concern or a problem that is there where different actors, different sectors have a common interest. And I think if you start from there, you will also be able to implement something and change, change them, something. But I think if you want to start with the whole picture as such, it, it, it will not work because it's too complicated, too costly, too lengthy, and the interests are not clearly enough there. Thank you for a very complex question <laughs> to remind us of what we're talking about here. But I think um, you brought up a really good point. That's where we have a lot of development initiatives, where we're trying to bring in the resources to help change the world, uh, and some of them very large scale and very top down. Uh, we're having another uh, session tomorrow. We have the launch of the 20 by 20 initiative, which is uh, an initiative to restore 20 million hectares of degraded land by the year 2020 here in Latin America, starting with political will and investment. But the next stage is, well, how is that going to play out on the ground for people? We've had a couple of decades, I think, at least, where we thought that uh, improving farm productivity was really in the hands of the farmers and it had to always be their investment and their profit and it all had to turn on that one farm and whether or not that was profitable. So we have these two completely separate paradigms, one a very large scale top down, another where a farmer has to be absolutely profitable in and of himself uh, for any intervention to be sustainable. But there is something in the middle here I think that landscapes can bring to that story. If you have, for example, degraded lands or a difficult situation, it's not easy for the smallholder farmer to be the only unit of, of profit making. That that's, doesn't really necessarily take many people very far, especially, for example, in Ethiopia. But we have something else in this landscape, something meeting in the middle. It's not so large scale, it's local. It's an actual place, a local place, where you bring together various aspects beyond the farm to actually help support the farm and the other industries. And I think that's what landscape approach brings. We should probably be trying to get away from this sort of, yeah, more academic view, landscape approaches, integrated approaches, and just speak plainly about what we're talking about. One of the examples is this, um, in this Lake Tana Basin in Kenya, what we're really talking about is that we have a classic situation of upstream um, land users, uh, the land is degraded, their farming practices are not very sustainable, and the people are very poor, and it's very difficult for them to improve their practices. And we have downstream, we have a city with six million people who want clean water, who want nice beer, who want power, uh, reliable power. And so what a landscape approach is doing is bringing those two sectors together, these poor smallholder farmers and the much more wealthy city uh, dwellers and water users, and trying to bring the resources 
that people are willing to pay for clean water directly up into communities and to support those communities. One thing that's very important in that process is looking at the trade-offs that might be occurring. If, if we're asking farmers to put in, say, tea or coffee or br bring back the forest, we have to acknowledge that they're going to be planting less maize and have less food security. There's a trade-off there that has to be balanced, and we have to have their interests uh, to the table, bringing them around the table to negotiate those kind of trade-offs. But Landscapes is about bringing those different perspectives together in the same place, in a local place. Okay, you guys can also ask each other a question, otherwise I would just come. Anybody else who wants to ask a question, make a comment, here you are. Yeah, I, uh, good, af good afternoon, good, e good evening. I'm Roger Garinga from uh, Philippines. Uh, I, I, I think I have to ask uh, first for, for your pardon if I, I didn't get the, the, the conditions about this compar comparing farmers' emission and the industrial emission because I, I think I did not see how, how, how the contribution of the manufacturing of the machines were inputted in the computation of, uh, of, the, of the emission. So probably you, you were talking about the, the comparing emission from, from the point of view of the production system only, not including the, the, you know, the fuel and the, the machine uh, manufacturing. And, and uh, the, the, other, the other question I would like to ask is, is that uh, when we were talking about uh, landscape approach, uh, key, key, key strategy there is land allocation. Uh, is, is, is there already an established mechanism or uh, method on, in which we can, we can actually uh, consider the carrying capacity of uh, different kinds of land use uh, allocations that, uh, you know, that we are trying to, to develop in different landscapes? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. respond to that? Mm -hmm. Is your mic working now? Uh, on the comparison of the two value chains, uh, every factor contributing to global warming has been uh, internalized, calculated in the, in the, in the yeah, calculations of the environmental footprint. So also fuel and so on used for the machines. The fact is that the, the parboiling process on the traditional stoves with, with, with wood uh, of the surrounding forests is, is, is very has much more emissions than if you use even diesel and so on for the for the machines and that that came out of that of that comparison so it has been taken into consideration it, it also in, in fact it also includes uh, there's also a footprint on water use a footprint on land use change and so on but the clearest was on the emission side where you could compare and see that the the industrialized chain with that regard is much, much better. Okay. There was and another part of the question on the land allocation. Okay, go for it. Your mic is working. Your <laughs> <laughs> mic is working. But I don't have, has someone the answer on that? Because in mm -hmm. my example, it was not mentioned. I didn't even get the question. I have to repeat the question. It's about carrying capacity. Yeah, I am. Um, and then you were talking about mechanisms or methodologies, probably even. Are there existing methodologies developed somewhere maybe in Wageningen and then can be applied in a landscape to measure uh, and assess carrying capacity? I'm sure there are. I'm very sure there are. But I really doubt the value of such generic models because usually they are wrong. Uh, and I think that's the point that, that, that we were trying to make, is that the, the, the fundamental change that landscape approaches bring is that it starts from place and from people who live and own and take care of their place. You cannot design a model for that. It happens in place itself. A small example, my 85, 86 year old father he never understood what I was working on when I was working on biodiversity, ecosystem governance, not a clue. And now finally I'm working on, on landscapes now. And now he understands what I'm working on because he knows his landscape. 
And he knows that he takes care of it. He's a farmer and he's getting a subsidy from Heineken Beer Brewery to manage his land well. And, and he likes that and he says, yeah, I take care of my landscape and my government is letting me down totally. But thanks God Heineken pays for me to take care of our land. And I think, yeah, it's, cool. it's as simple as that. So let those scientists develop their models and have conferences like this. And let us start at the bottom where you are working, yeah. bringing people together across boundaries. That's revolutionary. You're creating friendships where we have 100 years of war. Uh, and I think in your case, well, private farmers, private sector producers create value chains which are, which are better fit in the landscape than probably any other value chain in Nigeria. So uh, uh, that would be my response. <laughs> <laughs> Another question you want no, to No, I just want to oppose on the carrying capacity and on the modeling. Uh, I think it's, it's an important information that you need, that a, a government also needs to take decisions and to steer a bit the use of, of landscapes. I worked for a long time in Namibia where livestock is, is very important. And if you, if you think about droughts that occur there, uh, if the government doesn't know about carrying capacity and about how much livestock is there, they cannot react, they cannot, for instance, offer to the farmers to pay, uh, uh, how is it called, a fee if they bring their animals to the slaughterhouse in order to protect uh, common, common uh, pastures. It's an important information, but it's very, very difficult to get because in order to calculate a carrying capacity, for instance, you need long-term rainfall data, which is just not there, not even in Namibia where you have a very good measuring network. In other countries, you will just fail to do it. So you need to find a way on how to easily say something about the carrying capacity, also about carrying capacity in drought situations, in order to, to give to a government, for instance, the information that it needs to react and to protect landscapes. But probably farmers know. Yes, but they would not reduce their herds if they don't get enough money out of it. They would try okay. to, to sustain them as long as possible, even though the grounds degrade. So and they, the they, they try to, to reserve parts of pastures for themselves and use up first the common pasture grounds. So there's a lot of problems yeah. uh, related mm -hmm. to that. So a lot may have to be improved in the communication sphere. And in, indeed, the bringing different partners at landscape level together, those who know and those who make the policy, and then leave those in Wageningen and make their models. But we, in our landscape, we may be able to find the information and find the corresponding resources to get our problem solved. And then you need to convince those who have the power and to reserve for themselves their exactly. small parts. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have one more question, but, but are they really using these little puzzle figures from your presentation for the models? Ah, don't worry, just... I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> My question is related to, to his question, but it has to do more with land tenure. Because, for example, in Central America, the places where we work at the landscape level, one of the, the, the big challenges is that there are many, many uh, small farmers that rent land to be able to produce and then it's a very difficult situation to be able, for example, to work with them in more sustainable systems that will help to, you know, to have a more sustainable use at the landscape level. Uh, but you didn't, and as you mentioned, anything about land tenure or even natural resources property rights. So how that will play within the, all this picture? You want to respond directly? We have one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, be, okay, I, I love this topic. I, I realized, <laughs> listening to the four of us, I thought, oh my God, none of us is talking about land tenure, <laughs> which is actually the basis for any good landscape management governance without a proper land tenure, a clear land tenure. doesn't have to be formalized in a cadaster. It can be traditional. It can be bricolage to some halfway. It doesn't matter, but you need to have clarity. What we say in spatial theory, if you want people to make their place, they have to, to be granted that place. And if you don't grant them that place, then they will come and take it. So there is a big power issue there, which if you don't tackle that issue, then don't start, because it won't work. And especially don't start with investments. For, for every investment, be it water infrastructure, be it an investor who wants to work with, with farmers and to build contracts, 
they also need security of land tenure. That's that's a key issue. Yes. I have handed on the microphone already. Um, my name is Nathan Russell. I work at Seat with Deborah, and I have a question for her. Uh oh. And it has to do. <laughs> it has to do with the relationship between landscape approaches, like the one you described in uh, in the Tana uh, River Basin, uh, like one I saw yesterday, 150 kilometers south of here, in the Cañete River Basin, where a very similar benefit sharing mechanism is being set up, very similar to the one you're describing. So my question is about the relationship between the landscape approach and value chain approaches. As you and I know, in our organization, those two approaches operate separately. There's very little integration, if any, between them. And yet, what we heard farmers say yesterday in the Cañete Basin, the lower part of the Cañete Basin, is, is uh, several things. They acknowledge that they are the biggest users of the, of the water coming from the upper watershed. They acknowledge that if they don't invest in changing land use practices in the upper watershed, they're going to suffer in terms of water quality and quantity. They're willing to contribute. They are relatively more prosperous than the farmers in the upper watershed. They have irrigation water. They're 150 kilometers from a market. Yet, what they say is there are a lot of flaws, a lot of problems in the value chains that they participate in. Maize, grapes, cassava, etc. So they're saying we could give more in this new landscape approach if we had better value chain work that better linked us with markets. It gave us more, more power in markets. So, you know, how can we better link these, these two approaches starting in our own organization? <laughs> starting in our own organization. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's an interesting question because, of course, value chains tends to be along one commodity. Usually it's one commodity. And the big innovation that's happened over the last few years is that we bring together all the stakeholders along the chain, the marketers and the input and the output markets and everything, all with the farmers, instead of working again only with farmers and as an isolated unit, so that we can connect up all of those things. And it seemed to be a pretty much an anthema to the landscape approach, which is more about protecting the overall environment and the ecosystem services. And so they actually seem to be completely opposing paradigms, and I'm certainly as guilty as anybody of saying that these are completely opposing paradigms, that if you're focusing only on value chains, you almost never are taking account of the need for sustainability, sustaining natural resources. It's just the way that it usually plays out. But one thing that we are really trying to do now is bring together both those things, for example, in the growth corridors in Africa. In many countries in Africa, especially in the east and the south right now, there's these very large-scale initiatives to get lots of big investment into agricultural production, uh, increasing agricultural production, food security, et cetera, et cetera. They call them growth corridors, and they're trying to focus all of this investment, public and private investment, into these areas. And what we're trying to do there is bring both those together. So let's say they're going to invest in beans and maize. Well, bring the market the markets, the farmers to markets aspect into that planning, but also bring the land use planning, which is now completely missing from those. So bring those things together and to try to sustain some of the natural resources that people uh, will depend on the long term, because value chains alone without sustaining the resources are just going to burn out. So we do try to bring them together. Well, maybe a classical example is tourism value chain. And Kailash landscape I was talking about this year is year of horse. And according to Tibetan calendar, um, this is the most luckiest year. It comes every 13 years. So if you go there, then uh, you, know, you have enlightened yourself for the next uh, several generations. So you can imagine if one million tourists or pilgrims go to this landscape, which is about 15,000 feet on the average, on the average. So any biological or non-biological waste, you can understand what it means. So we use uh, the responsible tourism value chain as a rallying point between three countries in the landscape because that is, tourism is dependent on landscape. If landscape goes uh, you know, bad, then of course you have a lot of tourists, a lot of other pilgrims who come who don't, most probably don't like it. So we brought tour operators together from India, China and Nepal and devised a value chain which is clearly linked to the landscape. This was just an example that tourism is one such lens, uh, you know, value chain, yeah. Maybe just one, one addition. If, if 
we, we all know about that phenomenon of land grabbing, of investments that take large land areas. If you want to use them in, in a win-win situation, one prerequisite is that proper land use planning is done before in order for an investor to know <coughs> what land is really available for an investment. And the problem here is that an investor wants to go quickly somewhere and to start, whereas the land use planning process, if you first need to start it, what, what is the case in most countries, uh, is a long, long process. And, and that is, I think, this time frame thing is also a, a challenge that we need to look at. May I now oppose to you? <laughs> 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 I, I think if we have to wait for the planners, I, I'm yes. a planner myself, it will never happen. Mm -hmm. They take too long and mm -hmm. they don't know the terrain. Mm -hmm. But what, 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 what I increasingly recognize and makes me hopeful is that a lot of businesses who are so well in improving the value chains, they are starting to realize that their chains are at risk because their sourcing areas are getting totally damaged and there is social unrest and degradation and, and invasive species. And, and, and I, I think they, they are starting to realize that something horizontal, you cannot only work this way, you have to also work this way. Hmm. Example in Indonesia, where palm oil companies, oil palm companies, uh, I mean, people in Singapore, the investors, they are sick and tired of the smoke. And they've said, you've, you've got to stop this way of producing, we don't want it anymore. And they're now searching for other ways of managing their landscapes. And they're starting to understand how, how, thing, how reality works. And I'm, we're very ready to help them. Same with the cocoa. The cocoa price is going down because the quality is going down because we're screwing up the landscape where cocoa is being produced. And I think that urgency, that risk, that financial loss is what companies are finally starting to realize and they're trying to do better. And I'm quite optimistic about their learning capacity, I think. Although I don't, you know, I don't think I'm, I'm an eternal optimist or we wouldn't still be doing these things, right? We all have to believe that there's some hope in the future. But I think we should also tackle the issue that, you know, all here we're sort of on the same page about the landscapes, etc. But that the trend still, despite all of our good examples, the trends are completely the opposite. Mm. The trends and investment and what people are investing in is completely the opposite of this very nice case of the rubber you know, wanting to, mm -hmm. you know, have sustainable rubber. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that we have to, you know, confront that issue a little bit and see where is it we're going to interact. One thing where I do find hope is that it's not just, uh, like you say, how do you bring the value chains and the landscape approach together? It's partly at least coming up from the, the research and conservation, the agriculture communities and the conservation communities are now coming closer and closer into actually working and thinking together. And that's at least a first step, mm. I think. Mm. The next would be farmers and governments and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Mm. We have one more question here. Sure. Um, so I, my name is Carrie Wozniak. I'm from the University of Illinois. And I work with an institute that I would like to talk to you, Tanja, about um, the ADM Institute for the Prevention of Post-Harvest Loss. But just for the sake of the group also, I wanted to ask, um, I'm hearing value chain and, land, and landscape approach, and to me, um, post-harvest loss is kind of a perfect fit between those, because post-harvest loss is a value chain, and yet there's so much dynamics that have to flow back and forth. And I'm just, this is my second year at, at, at the GLF, and I'm surprised that there was barely a mention of it last year, and you're the only pr the session uh, that talked about it this year. So I'm glad that you did, and I'm just wondering if anybody, and, and Deborah, I heard you talked about um, lots of inputs into production, production, and um, I know people know about post-harvest loss, and I'm just wondering why it's not included in the discussion more so at, at this forum, and would like to see it, and it would help with it. Well, I was also wondering that. <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't know, maybe others have an answer. Oh, you, I'm, you. No, but I'm, uh, that's why I, I decided to, to, to bring it up in this yeah. session, but yeah, I think it's important. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Amanda Monaco. I'm from the Environmental Investigation Agency, uh, working particularly on forest, forestry work in Latin America. But my one question, so it seems, I really like this idea. I think it answers a lot of the questions I've had throughout my academic and professional career so far. Um, but my one question is, if you're going to get all these actors together at a table to talk, one thing that seems to be miss missing from our discussion is 
well, there are huge power imbalances between these groups. Um, so if you want to help the farmers in Ethiopia and help them make decisions about their landscape, how are you going to contrast that or hmm, kind of balance that power, raise that power as compared to private groups and government? Thank you. Well, I think that's the $10,000 question. I don't think that's, I don't have an easy answer for that. One thing we're thinking of doing is trying to bring more sort of social, um, social rights groups to the table working with us on these issues. We usually, for example, in, in, in East Africa, there's a lot of um, groups working on women's rights and empowerment and political activism and domestic violence and, and these types of issues. And they tend not to be um, working with the women in the sort of agricultural land use kind of sectors. So those, those things are kept really very separate. And so there is a lot of action in terms of political power, but maybe we can work with, we could get those people also together at the table, the people who are actually working to empower people politically with the sort of agricultural technologies and input and, and ideas that we have about managing landscapes. So that's one idea that we're, we're trying to pursue now because I, I think that's a, a very important point. The relations of power is, is very important. And maybe I just would only like to add, what, what really helps is the mentorship. You know, we do believe, and what we have done is that all the stakeholders which we are talking about, they will never come to a consensus, let's forget it. But if there's an equitable level of information, communication, and understanding what we are doing, and that helps a lot. And that is what we are trying to build on, and then finally have a generic mentorship program for all these policymakers, practitioners, private sector together. As I, as I give an example of Nepalese farmers going to India and Indian farmers coming to Nepal, similar exercise we do with policymakers and actual line agencies, take them around and show them how it works. And I think that, that helps in getting the consensus, at least near to that. Yeah. There's one more question here. I, I want to support, I'm sorry, I, I forgot your name, because uh, I want to support the comment you made, and you're on to something when you pointed out that the value chain concept and value chain discussion is overrated and it's extremely linear. From a farmer's point of view, there are two issues in today's model, and that's that the smallholder farmer cannot build equity in the way the land tenure and the production systems are set up today. We must find ways to shorten the value chain and bring the processing capacity mm -hmm. into the communities where mm -hmm. the farmers live. and give the farmers equity in that business. Otherwise, as land becomes scarcer and land becomes more controlled by government, farmers lose, their children leave. The job is not interesting, we're not building the factories in the right place. Yes, we need to industrialize cereal and rice production and processing, but if that moves 700 kilometers away from where it's being produced, nobody's helping, but I think you, you can convince my skepticism if you can bring together the notion of shortening the value chain mm -hmm. and bringing in landscape, uh, the landscape approach that might create some kind of new synergies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe reacting on the last two, the, the, the last two uh, speakers, um, I, I think power, power defines it all. And, and to me, to be honest, this silly picture that I showed with a round table with all different stakeholders, it's silly, it's impossible. <laughs> it's, 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 it's conflict if you do it like that. But, but I think that's probably the, the furthest vision you can have and, 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 would, and, and, and a huge struggle has to go before you get there. Uh, I don't believe in consensus, but I do believe in common concerns. And I do believe if at landscape level people come to realize that they have a common problem and whether they like each other or not, they've got to do something. And, and a second point I would like to make, that, and I'm very much with you here, Rajan, coaching or capacity building. I, I work in Wageningen, not in the research department, but in the part that's doing capacity development for professionals, mm -hmm. private partners, uh, producer organizations, uh, civil society groups, governments, and I think from all sides, capacities need to be developed. The capacity to take more right to take more power or the capacity to actually give more power to people and, and get to a more balanced power relation. Uh, that's the only way to get there. If not, you get to a sort of peace and harmony story which will not make sense. Mm.
Okay, we are basically in terms of time, over the time that was allocated to us. If there's not any more burning questions, and I want to cut it off because there's nobody waiting here for us to come in. Only I'm supposed to tell you that there's a knowledge fair going on outside. Otherwise, I would ask Eberhard sort of to do the job of telling us what the audience actually, you're, you're the representative, what the audience thinks about the whole thing. I'm Eberhard Goll from the German Development Corporation and uh, I was asked to do a wrap-up. I will do it quick and dirty for you. And I think uh, there are some messages we should take with us this evening. The first and I think the most important word I have heard this session this evening was change. We have to change our attitudes, we have to change our behavior, we have to sit together to find out where we want to go. Because I found in one of your presentations a very nice word. Innovative livelihood quality of life. If we want quality of life, then we have to look at ourselves. I would like to take you back after the journey to the Hindikush and to Nigeria where we had some nice examples how things can work with the landscape approach to near where Mr. Russell was yesterday, Lima itself. You are in a city where it never rains. We have 60 millimeters rain per year in this city. We are living nearly 9 million people asking for water each and every day. Water was another keyword I found out of our session where Cora built up a very nice model of understanding landscape. Thank you very much for, for this very didactical part and I appreciate very much what we learned from you. The action we have seen, when I look back from my professional background, it looks a little bit what we have done 25, 30 years ago when we called it integrated rural development. There might be some additional subjects today which we have learned is necessary to include. And one of the most important issue I think by myself is the issue of institution and governance. Both are key to clear clearance when it comes to actions between countries, between borders, where we want to build trust and confidence on what we are doing. Now, when it comes to farmers, and I'm coming from a farm, I can really understand your uh, point when you say and where I get the assistance from all this nice world of organizations which are dealing on conferences one after another. And I think there is a need, an urgent need <coughs> to make an international division of labor for what we are doing all together sometimes overlapping ourselves. Coming back to Lima, where you go this evening taking pro probably a shower out of water, which is not assured for this city. I can assure you that this city will face over the next 10 years a real challenge. The, there are a lot of people already in this city which has not 24 hours access to water. 
the aquifer we are sitting on is going down around two meters groundwater level per year. So you can imagine what will be happened with water resources as one of the biggest issue I personally believe in the near future for agriculture. The whole coastal area of Peru is depending on water resources for irrigation projects which has been built over the last 50 years in this country. So an approach on coordination between the different parts involved as we have heard, is necessary. And as the carnival is called outside, I will not like <laughs> that you stay much more time with me. Let us thank the presenters for this nice session we had this afternoon. And let me thank also the moderator for the moderation of this session. Thank you all. Gracias. And... Hasta mañana.